What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Check the Kick Podcast. I'm the host, Devin. Sherdog.com is the website. And we are coming back off of a, uh, I'm going to sound like Dana White, a badass weekend of fights. Um, UFC 305 was pretty cool. We got the announcement of UFC 307 with the main event um, and how that card has kind of been put together. Jose Aldo is back. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit coming up. Um, and then this weekend, to finish off the show, we're going to talk about uh, Cannoneer versus Cayo Bojalio. And then one of the uh, Ultimate Fighter finale fights, because it's also the finale of the show. Um, hope you guys have all had a pretty cool week. Hope you guys all caught the fights live. Um, also, there was the uh, Craig Jones Invitational. I didn't watch it. Um, but there is some... Uh, chatter that that was a pretty cool event i was enveloped with ufc 305 and i've been fishing a lot this weekend too so i just that you know sometimes you can only pick two out of three things to do and it was fishing in ufc 305 um starting off the show we're gonna talk about uh and still Knox, drikas duplessis uh defeats israel adesanya via fourth round rear naked choke or a neck crank um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, similar. Um, that's his second neck crank in the UFC. Funny enough, uh, he also got a very similar position and win over uh, Darren Till. Drikas Duplessis is, I mean, I said it in the Sure Dog Slack. If you listen to Keith and Ben sh- recap show, they mentioned me there where, yeah, Drikas Duplessis is like the best worst fighter ever because he does everything wrong but he does everything right <clears throat> it's always uh winning him fights trick is two plus c in his last three fights in the ufc he knocked out robert whitaker um also <clears throat> i mean if you watch go back and watch a robert whitaker fight like you watch the first round and he was crushing him on the ground on the way to potentially finishing there um and then in the second round just crushes him against the cage with a barrage of punches and punches to the body um, then he went out there and had a tit for tat uh, war with Sean Strickland. Some people thought Sean Strickland when he won via split decision, really close fight with clearly the second best middleweight in the world right now was Sean Strickland. And then now he went out there and, <clears throat> you know, defended his belt against Israel Adesanya. Um, we're going to talk about Drikas's legacy. We're going to talk about Israel's legacy a little bit, but mostly just talk about the fight first. Um, really close through three rounds like izzy had a lot of success towards the beginning of the rounds of the fight and then drikas even said that his his um game plan was to basically kind of meet him in the middle of the octagon for the first half of the round and then press him and get on him in the second half of the round which is smart because a lot of times just as a judge it's it's we're going to talk about gamrot and hooker but if you look back at that hooker versus gamrot fight um, a lot of people thought Gamrot won the first round. I put it in the sure dog slack. I'm like, they're going to give this to, to Hooker. Number one, he won the back half of the round. They both did probably equal damage. But Hooker won the back half of the round, and plus the crowd and all that shit. But it's, it, it's humans are not always the brightest creatures on the planet. And um, if you show them two really, really good things, but one before the, one before the other, they're going to obviously remember the one you know, the latest one. And that's how this round just all, a lot of these rounds went where Izzy did a lot of good work through the first half of the round. And then Drikas would come back and do, you know, equal or better work in the last half of the round and kind of steal a couple rounds. Um, but it was, it was just a really close fight. Um, Drikas, he's just such a strange dude where I'm finally think I'm understanding him, where I think he, number one, just hits way harder than we expect. Like when you look at Alex Pajara, <clears throat> for example, um, when you watch Alex Pajara hit Jamal Hill with a left hook, you can watch kind of how perfectly that shot is lined up. Um, his feet are planted. His body mechanics are right. It's like, oh, no wonder why he uh, uppercuts people's heads off he's throwing a perfect punch that's why it's working um Drikas is not like that Drikas is throwing these crazy 
four punch blitzing combinations or like maybe the first three shots miss but then that fourth one lands and you've already taken the back foot your feet are crossed out and he's clubbing you um he had a lot of success in the second round with his grappling where he got the takedown Izzy he was actually able to stay safe there but Drikas has got he's got good defense in the weirdest way like he's really really good at getting his hands up to block things he's not sean strickland op operates with much more of an open guard where he's kind of blocking things before they get to him um Drikas much more operates he like kind of pillars and has a, a more of a tight guard but really good vision really good reactions to getting hit um even in that even in that fourth round up before the finish in a, in the third round too like izzy kind of started cruising and was like ripping him to the body and Drake is just like unfazed by everything i don't know what the dude's made out of everybody talks about that roberto sold each knockout where he was kind of met in the pocket and got clubbed but that was at 170 and that's like what people aren't mentioning where you know clearly alex pajera is a monster at 185 but look at him at 205 like clearly the weight cut is 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 diminishing Look at Drikas. He's fucking huge. Obviously, cutting to 170 is going to be diminishing for him. Obviously, he's going to have more durability. Um, <clears throat> I mean, he's struck with, like, I'm going to call Anderson Silva, obviously, one of my favorite fighters and the best middleweight ever and probably the best middleweight striker ever. But, like, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe and crumbled Robert Whitaker on the feet, who's definitely the top five middleweight strikers ever. And if you want to call Israel the second best middleweight striker and the second best middleweight ever, well, he struck with him pretty much tit for tat in this fight too. Um, he exposed one of Israel's big flaws. And when I say exposed, he didn't discover it. He's one of many people to expose this flaw. Um, is he's just way, I don't want to call him a smoke and mirrors striker, but a lot of his striking is built off of uh feints posturing um for lack of better terms psyching you out and making you think that there's a lot of really a lot of shit to be worried about and quite frankly there is yes like really sneaky question mark kicks pretty good leg kicks pretty good body kicks um pretty potent boxing but is he in the striking can really i don't want to say he can only operate but he operates best at his kicking range and something he's really good at doing is closing his kicking range and getting into his boxing range like he's doing the drink he hit him with a body he would hit, kick him to the body and then just take a small step forward and rip him and then rip him with another you know two hooks to the body like that was really clean from izzy but if you don't respect his feints and you just pressure him he's just willing to take the back foot and it also like through this whole fight, like Izzy landed a lot of good shots on Drikas. Drikas's left kick looked really good. I think I think he kind of got away from the kicking. He had a lot of success in the first and second round. He kind of got away from it in the third round. But he has a really dexterous left kick. Like he throws a good high kick, throws a good body kick, throws a good leg kick himself. A lot of people have had success. Like Alex Pereira had a lot of success um, leg kicking Israel Adesanya. And, and Jan, Jan Blahovich did as well, along with checking leg kicks from Adesanya. Um Drikas's athleticism, his strength, his power, his stick to and his just witty game planning is what's getting him here because he's, I mean, when you watch the tape, there's like, he crosses his feet, he's tripping over himself, he's like, the way he throws punches is like someone just trying to throw a fastball over and over again, and someone that's not very good at it, but fuck. The, the best striker in middleweight history, some people had him on the back foot running away from him. Um, the fourth round, he clipped Izzy in the pocket with a really nice check left hook. Um, and then that kind of caused Izzy to circle out. And then Drikas just threw one of his weird, awkward running forward combos. Izzy tried to come out the right side. Drikas hit him behind the ear. He dropped Izzy. And then Izzy went circling to his left at this point. Izzy kind of does the, the point to the ground. Drikas is like, okay, cool. That's what I want to do. Hops in, clubs him with a hook. 
that point, Izzy has just turned his back to him and running a la Gustav, Alexander Gustafsson. You know, he's known for that. But he was rocked from at that point. Drikas kind of closed the distance through two big right hooks, hit Izzy on the ear, behind the ear, kind of gets behind him, shucks him to the ground, sinks in the hooks, gets the neck crank. Um I don't know if Izzy, I don't want to say he got like mentally broken, but I mean, no one, Izzy did everything he could possibly do right in that fight. Like he escaped the ground in the second round, was landing his shots and having his fight in it. Like it still didn't matter. And that's never really happened to, to Izzy before where he was able to have his fight and he just lost, kind of lost it. I guess in the first MMA fight against Alex Pajara, where he, Alex had Izzy's fight with him. Um, but I want to get back to the expose the, the back foot thing. Um, this is now three fights in a row where Izzy has even even in the second fight with Alex Pajero where he knocked him out and did the whole archery thing over his body or whatever. Um, he was still on the back foot on the cage getting rained on and you know, shout out to him for, I mean, that's, that's kind of the game plan he had to have against Alex, but he was still getting lit up, hit leg kicks, body shots, big knees. Like if he didn't pull that counter out against Alex, I mean, obviously if there's no if fans or butts, he, he knocked him the fuck out, but it was still a tendency, um, still a tendency willing to just take the back foot. Sean Strickland, go watch that fight. All he did was get on the back foot, especially after the, what got him almost knocked out by Sean Strickland was him taking and here even if Drikas didn't get that submission like Izzy was all he was, got rocked by the left hook dropped running against the cage getting punched like he was wasn't in a good way after that and Drikas has the ability to just turn a fucking fight around like that he's shown it in all of his fights um which funny is like the Robert Whitaker fight is like his cleanest performance <laughs> which is but even like against dudes like Darren Till, Derek Brunson, Brad Tavares, I, he's having less of those awkward moments at the championship level, which is making a difference. Like he didn't make mistakes against Sean Strickland. And that's what helped him win, win the split decision. Drix has good cardio. He's tough as fuck. Um, Izzy in the post fight said, you know, I made a mistake, you know, um, not trying to break the gable grip, but like, no, dude, you made up way more mistakes with your striking. It, it wasn't. Yeah, you made you might have made mistakes in the grappling, but you made a lot more mistakes on the way there. And he did it this whole fight. Anytime Drikas would step forward, and I said this in the preview, like Izzy is not a great back foot counter puncher. Like at range, at his kicking range, or at his boxing range, where he's mixing in the feints, getting people to bite. Um that's his thing. But if you force him on the back foot, I don't want to say he falls apart, but it failed him in this fight, failed him against Sean Strickland, almost failed him against um, Alex, it failed him against Alex in their first fight. That's how he got finished. Um, and then also, if you compare him to someone like Anderson Silva, like Anderson Silva, when he went to the ground, he was getting finishes. Submissions over Dan Henderson, Travis Luter, Chael Sonnen. He could be losing a whole fight getting dominated on the ground. Um as for legacy, you know, if you want to call Israel Adesanya the second best middleweight on the planet or ever, sorry, I wouldn't argue it. Um, but at the same time, clearly Drikas is coming. I don't know how many more wins it would take to surpass to surpass uh, Izzy's legacy. I think if Drikas goes out there and like gets a fight with Sean Strickland and finishes him. Um, and then goes out there and, and finishes another guy or two. I think finishing fights at the highest level is going to, for me personally, going to hold way more water than Izzy's just tepid performances where he's unwilling to take the risks, like against Yoel Romero, like against Jared Cannonier, like... God, there's like five more. Why am I, why am I blanking? Second Robert Whitaker fight, second Marvin Vittori 
you know, I, I think if he goes out there and finishes Sean Strickland, that's going to at least equate to the Marvin Vittori fight and the Yellow Armour fight and the Jared Cannonier fight. Also, too, like Sean Strickland dominated Adesanya. If, I mean, imagine if, if Drikas goes out there and finishes Sean Strickland and finishes Politon, because Politon is also talking about, hey, let's let's have a fight at 185. We'll come back down one last time. If Drikas finishes Sean Strickland and finishes Politon at middleweight, I'm putting him above Izzy. That's me personally. I think a finish over someone like Sean Strickland and finishing a dude like Politon in back-to-back fights, fuck throw a win over someone like Hamzat Shamayev in there or another random contender. Yeah, I'd, I'd put him as the number two, which is crazy. Um, DDP, the, the best, worst fighter ever. Um, as he says, he's not done. The city kickboxing, no USADA, strength and conditioning program looked really good for Dan Hooker or looked good for Kai Car France. Israel looked physically good. Um he has like over 140 professional combat sports fights between kickboxing, boxing, and MMA. He's got a lot of fights. He's 35. Um, one thing I would say is I don't think Israel would have handled a win here with nearly as much grace as Drikas did. Um, you know, as he had this crazy rivalry where he's shooting the arrows into Alex Behera, and I could only imagine he would have done something to Drikas. So Drikas handled this really well. He even gave him like a gift after. And I'm not trying to gas one guy up and push one guy down. I'm just giving you, from what we've seen in the past, one guy has a certain way of acting after a win and, you know, the other guy does as well. One guy seems to be a little more respectful. Um, and I pre- I appreciate that. It, even Israel gave him a lot of respect, which is nice. I, I commend that. He's like, hey, you've got the torch now. Maybe you can go and inspire other young fighters. Izzy said he's not done. I'd love to see him fight like Yuri Prohoshka at 205. Um, I don't know if he'll go to 205 because he's got his, you know, his dude Carlos Olberg up there. Izzy's at the point, though, like, it's crazy that Sean Strickland and Drikas Duplessis are the best two middleweights in the world when you have Robert Whitaker. And Israel Adesanya is still in the top five of that division. And what's crazy is like, clearly, I mean, we haven't seen Strickland fight Whitaker yet, but we did see Whitaker get crushed by Drikas and we watched Sean Strickland and Drikas fight. And when you're stacking these guys up, you almost have to play MMA math if they haven't fought each other. But like, I don't want to say significantly better, but there's there's a gap between Strickland and Duplessis and the rest of the division and, and that and, and the rest of the division does include Robert Whitaker and Israel Adesanya and I just find that crazy like one and two are up here and everybody else is just a couple down and for Izzy and you just would never three years ago if someone told you this they'd, you'd be like you're high as a kite um Adesanya should fight someone at 205 that's fucking cool like Yuri Pahashka or he should um at this point fight a young up-and-comer yeah people talked about Bo Nickel we'll see if that something like that happens um it's too bad hobocop is not like higher in the rankings but i'd love to see izzy fight the winner of uh michelle pahara and fluffy hernandez that'd be really cool um good fight i'm glad the pre-fight stuff didn't get so ugly everybody mentioned how quiet it was i'm okay with it being quiet as long as it's not ugly um all around fun fun fight weird fight both guys I don't know. I, in a way, both guys didn't look their best, but also looked their best. Um, shout out to Drikas. South Africa still got, still knocks. Moving on to the co-main event, Kai Car France took on Steve Ursig in a maybe number one contender fight. Maybe for Steve Ursig was coming off of a really impressive loss over, uh, the current champion in Alejandro Pantoja. And I, I, there is someone out there that says, you know, you can't really rate someone off of a loss, even if they look good. And this is a fucking prime example of it. Kai Car France knocked Ersig's head off. Um, Ersig looked good through part of the first round, making his reads. But Kai Car France, he is five foot four, and he has got to be one of the hardest hitting people that are under five and a half feet that have ever walked this earth. Um, he's probably 
is he not the hardest hitting 125er? Uh, someone is going to be like, no, cop, you're crazy. But like, okay, well, show me the proof in the UFC because I don't see it. You need Ode Osborne. So I'm going to call Kai Kara France the hardest puncher at 125 on the roster until I see something different. Um, he crushed Steve Erseg. Erseg is a guy that likes to stay in the pocket. He He's slick. What Kai Kara France did was really, really smart. He, he threw that shifting combination. Really, really reminded me of uh, the way Jorge Masvidal knocked out Darren Till, where he kind of throws a shot to miss a shot to close the space to also gain the momentum when he switches his feet to throw the other hand. Dustin Poirier does this as well. It's funny that two guys from ATT, and then we have KKF doing this. Um, that switching combo, uh, fucking this crushed Urseg. Urseg goes diving at the legs clubbed him a couple more times maybe a little early but you know Ursig just came off of a just came off of a fight not long ago was it back in june was it june may may sorry um and i'm, I'm glad i'm glad it was stopped it kind of sucks for Ursig. like the dude got you know just catapulted into a title fight and then he's fighting in a number one contender like he needs to kind of take a step back um which is funny because a step back is someone like Manal cop who can't who is pretty good um or is he i don't know but um kai car friends look great he barely lost to amir albazi amir albazi is like i mean spinal issues and and we just saw a process fucking slaughter the leech and the leech was gone with spinal issues so that doesn't give me a lot of faith for him brandon moreno is on a leave of absence brandon revel is the number one contender weirdly but pantoja's beat him like three times um i and i know kkf and pantoja have history from a tough house but it's 2024 kai car france looked really good this is a good time for him to do this. Hey, I just fucking crushed the dude that you barely beat that he had to make a mistake for you to beat him. I went out there and crushed him in, in, in under three minutes. Come on, Pantoja. Um, we're not even going to talk a lot about this fight because there's not a lot to talk about. Ursig is again, a dude that likes to stay in the pocket and he typically does have head, good head movement. But when a lot of people that were watching this fight are like, Ursig's making his reads, Ursig's making his reads. Well, guess what? Kai Car France made his reads too. He realized if I throw a big shifting combination, he's going to try to pull my first punt, and that's going to put him in position to get clubbed by my other one. And that's exactly what happened. Not a lot to talk about. Kai Car France looked, looked fucking phenomenal. I'm happy for him. The dude, you know, um, city kickboxing, no use out of strength and conditioning. Um he had some concussion issues that were very worrisome for me, and I'm I'm glad to get this one wrong. I did get the main event right, but I'm glad to get this one wrong. Shout out to Kai Kara Franz. Third fight from the top of this card, we had Dan the Hangman Hooker, also known as Dan Fucking Hooker. I know this is on YouTube. That may get me flagged, but come on. The guys earned the name. Uh, he defeated Matthews Gamera via split decision um, in a absolute war. Dan Hooker is a dude that I don't know what he's made out of. In between the third and fourth round, he's all lumped up. Both eyes are swelling shut, cut to bits. Been defending takedowns, scrapping his ass off. Matthias Gamera is getting tripped over the stool, and he is laughing at his corner saying, I love this shit. This is awesome. Um, what Dan Hooker did really well, this was the best – even though he won via split decision, this was the absolute best way he could have fought this fight. Incredible, incredible ideas on what to do to stop Gamrod's single leg game, and maybe someone else can expose this. Again, exposure doesn't mean discovery. I talked to someone on Twitter about this. When someone says they exposed it, that means that they just brought it to light. That doesn't mean that they discovered it. Um, and what Dan Hooker exposed was Gamrot's got a single leg game and he's really good at chaining it together. But let's just blast him with elbows over and over again. Tons of elbows behind the ear. And then let's just grab guillotines. 
if we force him to that head on the outside single, if we force him in a guillotine over and over again, he goes from wrestling to defending. And I think that that is uh, just smart, just really, really smart from Hooker. Um, Gamrot's and, and Gamrot's game is not really – he's turning things around a bit. Like his, his boxing looked good. His striking looked good. His kicking looked good. Um, but Gamrot's game just doesn't seem like it's fit for MMA in 2024 anymore, unfortunately. And, wh- and wh- why I say that is he's not a control grappler. He did land a lot of good ground and pound, and that's what we need to see from him more. But typically he's much more of a uh, rinse and repeat type of guy where he's not using his – He's not having a lot of effective offense with his grappling. And if you're not having a lot of effective offense with the grappling and you spend three minutes of the round wrestling, the other guy spends two minutes of the ground, two minutes of the round hurting you. Or even if he spends a minute of the round defending takedowns and and stuff, and he hits you with some elbows behind the ear, hurts you on the feet, makes you take a step back after, you know, it causes you to reset after you get struck. Um, It's just not, uh, it's not conducive to the scoring criteria that we're working with right now. And that's kind of what happened to Gamrot. Um, really, really close fight either way. There could have been 30, 27s either way. Honestly, uh, Hooker's boxing, his forward pressure, he was like the first person to ever make Gamrot really tired. His forward pressure, He, I love that he is willing to stab the body with those teeth kicks, knowing... When you're Dan, Dan Hooker's slow. He knows who he is. The dude's got like 40 MMA fights. The dude had a, a Pride Rules MMA fight when he was like 20 with a heavyweight weighing at like one, and he used to fight at 145. Like, he's a fucking animal. But he's stabbing teeps to the body against a dude that you know wants that low single is typically a death sentence. Unless your name is Dan Hooker, um, those teeps to the body, his boxing looked good, the way he was cutting the cage off. Um, Gamrod is usually very offensive and he is but the longer the fight played out the same thing as kind of Jalen Turner he turned Gamrod almost into a desperate fighter where Gamrod was like I'm forced to take the back foot I'm forced to strike this guy let me go for takedowns there was multiple times in this fight where Hooker is hitting him with these like Travis Brown downward elbows behind the ear and you could see Gamrot like physically getting bothered by that. And then you mix him with that guillotine and he's like, I just got to get the fuck out of here. This is like fight of the year contender. Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje are going to get it. But Dan Hooker and Gamrot deserve. This is an, an incredible fight. Best fight on the card. Main event was good too. Um, MMA decisions, I think seven scored it for Hooker, eight for Gamrot. This is in Hooker's backyard, something that you have to keep in mind too. So like when he does something, the crowd's going to go crazy. And I mean, Gamrot it's not like he didn't know that that wasn't news. He didn't just randomly wake up in Australia and be like, Oh, I'm in Dan hooker's backyard. The fool took this fight knowing he was going to be not the fool, but the guy took the fight knowing he's going to be in hooker's backyard. So he knew going into this fight that he's going to have to not allow hooker to have those ooh and ah moments. And he did. Um, not even much to say like Hooker's going to be a top five lightweight after his fucking wars with Edson Barbosa, his fucking wars with Hooker getting, or sorry, his wars at Poirier, um, getting fucking crushed by Chandler. But here he is still I mean, getting his arm ripped off like this by Islam. But guess what? The dude is one more fight away from a title fight. If he goes out there and beats Charles Oliveira, which is a fight that's probably going to get made. He's, I mean, he's had a broken arm. He was supposed to fight Bobby Green like six months ago. Now he's a top five ranked lightweight. Just um, for Gamrot, you should probably fight Patty Pimblett. I guarantee that's what the UFC is going to do. Gamrot has never had, in my opinion, like a super decisive win against a high, like his Armin Sarukian win. I don't think that was a win. Um, him and Patty Pimblett would just be fun. The scrambles, the forward pressure, can Gamrot, you know, I don't know. Because they're also kind of pretty similar fighters in a way. Um, Hooker, I think he should just maybe rematch Michael Chandler or rematch 
Dustin Poirier or fight Charles Oliveira or wait to see the outcome of the Holloway to Poirier. If Holloway loses against Toporia, maybe he can fight him for the BMF. Hooker's got he Hooker opened a lot of fucking doors at this stage of his career with this win. Tattooed blonde hooker, the hangman. Dude rose again from the dead on a killer streak, fighting his ass off. Shout out to the uh, CKB No USADA Strength and Conditioning. All right. First segment of the show, Out With The Old, is wrapped up. We're going to be doing a little bit of talking about UFC 307 for the middle segment of the show, What's Hot. This past week, Dana White went on his uh, really close to the phone, odd camera angle, um video announcing 307 where he probably used the word badass and screamed it about five times shout out to dana white that always cracks me up um but we're gonna talk about ufc 307 uh white card has been announced alex pajera is fighting khalil roundtree roundtree is the number eight ranked lightweight it's really funny because the number one contender um magomed Ankalaev, just got booked against alexander rakic like later that month but uh UFC calls, Pajara picks the phone back up, says, F it, I'm in, give me Roundtree. Roundtree has a history in the UFC of violently beating Gokan Saki and a lot of other glory guys. So will will the glory killer reign supreme? It's a cool card. Um, people are talking shit. Jam- Jamal Hill, like, I just imagine him, like, walking around his house with a fist balled up, really angry, ready to punch his brother. I'm just kidding. Um because he was like going off at the mouth saying, uh, I can't believe the number eight guy is getting a title shot, blah, blah, blah. Like, dude, you got knocked out by this guy. You're not go- like, and you've done nothing since. Go fight Yuri Prohoshka. Go beat him up. Then maybe you can get a title fight. Go fight an Alexander Rakic like Ankalaev is doing. You know, you beat Johnny Walker and then you beat an old Glover and here we are. You lost against Alex. So come on, dude. Um, Co-main event on that. Raquel Pennington has taken on Juliana Pena. I'm glad they didn't make this the main event. No offense. I think what the UFC would love to happen is for Pena to defeat um, Raquel Pennington and then Kayla Harrison, who's also on this card, to defeat uh, Caitlin Vieira. Caitlin Vieira is ranked number two in that division. Um, Kayla Harrison is ranked number three. The, the UFC is hoping Juliana Pena wins this fight and they can put Pena versus Harrison. They the UFC needs Kayla Harrison to beat Ketlin Vieira and the UFC needs Raquel Pennington to beat or to lose to uh Juliana Pena. It's a cool cool co main event, I guess. You know, I just it's too bad it's not Kayla Harrison, but I understand what they're doing. Like show us she can make 135 one more time. Um Joaquin Buckley is taking on Wonder Boy. Um if you go to UFC.com sh- Shows that Jose Aldo is taking on Mario Bautista. However, I hear per our guy, uh, friend of Sure Dog, uh, Big Marcel, and I'm just going to validate this one more time. Um, this is per Big Marcel, and I could be wrong, but I did see somewhere. Maybe it was deleted by him. Um, man, I could have swore he posted it, but now it looks to be gone. Um, I saw that Henry Cejudo was supposed to be taken on Jose Aldo, but that could be incorrect. Um, maybe it just maybe it is Mario Bautista. Hold on, that. Come on, Big Marcel's social media. I no longer see the post. Maybe maybe it. I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Hopefully it is Henry Cejudo versus Jose Aldo because that'd be cool. Um, Roman Delize is taking on Kevin Holland. Yeah. Aljo versus Malzar Evola. That's cool. Um, they kind of put the card together finally. I know we've all been waiting. Uh, other cards further in the year are already made up. Um, Salt Lake City is semi close to me, so maybe I'll go to that. Maybe. Um I'd probably rather go to like the Oregon coast or like go to Yellowstone or something like that, but maybe I'll go to this event. We'll see. Um, just wanted to chat about UFC 307. Quick little, uh, quick little chat about it. We're going to go ahead and move on to the final segment of the show. 
moving on to the final segment of the show and with the new we're going to just talk about two fights i wanted to talk about three um but the way that the timeline added up i really want to talk about the tough finale um which we're going to talk about the middleweights but we don't know about the featherweights yet um or we do but i'm not going to say it here um and then i'm going to talk about the main event cannoneer cannoneer versus uh, kaya bahayo it's not that great of a card like angela hill versus tabitha richie she's going to be like the oldest woman I think outside of Jessica Penne, maybe to possibly get a win um, in straw at women's straw weight. But, and there's a couple like uh, Slava cause versus lawn top. Like that could be a fun fight, um, but not a lot of name value. Um, but we are going to talk about the tough finale, the middleweight tough finale, Robert Valentine versus Ryan loader. Um, if you haven't been keeping up, these guys have made it all the way up to the finals, and uh, both of them are pretty good fighters. Uh, odds on this fight are Robert Valentine is a minus 160 favorite. Ryan Loader is a plus 130 dog. That's going to be changing, and I can only find one site that has that odd right now. Um, Robert Valentine, he's got a 10-3 and three record, so not the most shiny, pretty record, but he did lose two fights in a row. That was in 2018 and 2019. One of them was to Evo Aslan up at 205, and it's been six years. Um, his most recent one was via knee bar, but that was back in March of 2022. Since then, um, he has a knockout via retirement. It's funny because he's like – in his last one, two, three, four, five fights, he's had two knockouts via retirement. Um, that's his opponents are on that Herbert Burns tip. Um, <laughs> but to get knockouts via retirement um, at the end of round one and then at the end of round two, like you're just beating the fucking shit out of people. Um, Ryan Loader, he is an American, a little bit older, um, 33 years old. He's got six wins and one loss. Uh, He's a standard college all American wrestling kind of guy. What I he's not bad. Like, but one of his last opponents is Edmund Shabazian's brother, Leon Shabazian. And uh Leon Shabazian is not good at all. Like all the problems that Edmund Shabazian has, like you could take that up and turn it up to 10. Um, I don't want to be mean, but that's just the truth. Um, Ryan Loader, he doesn't really have a punching game, a lot of kicks and he's a good grappler. He's a good control grappler. He can get takedowns when he needs them. He's pretty gritty, pretty tough. Anyone off the call American college wrestling scene is going to have that grit and that toughness to them just based off of their lifetime of, re of wrestling you know most of them start in middle school some of them younger than middle school up through high school and then into college it's a fucking grind um robert valentine is a his last win on the ultimate fighter was really really dope he kind of got clubbed in a exchange where he was doing okay in the fight um but then he gets this like really slick weird like arm bar I, I would need to go watch the fight back i actually watched it when it debuted last tuesday um the fight before that he got this crushing step in elbow he is a um kind of fits the mold to middleweight perfectly i mean we have the champion and drikas two plus he were like not great defense but who cares a lot of really good offense offense is the most important thing in mma let's just be honest um being defensive is important but like robert valentine he's not a control grappler, but even on the show. And one thing I really liked about him on the, on the ultimate fighter, he was the one that like cared the most about his team. He wanted, he was definitely taken in the experience that like Alexa Grosso, his coach made him. My Amazon just went up when I said Grosso's first name. So I'm not going to say her name again, Um, but that's funny. Um, he was coaching his teammates like he was the head corner he was coaching grappling like in the house which i thought was fucking cool um just student of the game shit um he's younger than ryan loader he's 29 years old and at middleweight i think that's like the perfect time to come into the ufc especially with this record and especially from what i've seen from him um 
Ryan Loader's probably going to get the takedowns in this fight, maybe get the control. But on the feet, even on the Ultimate Fighter, his last time out, he had moments where once he, he kind of got buzzed up on the feet. And I don't know how well he is going to take being the nail. And Robert Valentin, at some point in the Robert Valentin fight, he's going to figure out a way to make his opponent the, the nail. He's always crushing forward. He's always, you know, just trying to be offensive, whether it's with his strikes or with his grappling. He's a, got really, really good slick submissions. I mean, his game, if he's got two wins, he's got 10 MMA fights, and out of his last five fights, two of his wins are TKO via retirement. Like, that's the definition of breaking your opponent. Um, I think he's going to go out there, maybe face some adversity, get stuck on his back through round one, still be in Ryan Loder's face. Ryan Loder is not damaging enough of a fighter. Um, the person, the guy that Valentin fought in his second fight on the Ultimate Fighter House, buzzed him up on the feet and Valentin just stuck through and, and when it got to the grappling he's just he's more well-rounded and he's much more of a finisher and he's much more of a mean fighter than Ryan Loader um so give me the slight favorite to win this and uh he's he's just such a weird personality to Robert Valentin he like slept outside he's like a true Viking type dude he, and he, he'd just be a cool fucking addition to men's middleweight such a weird division a guy like robert valentine i could see just sliding in perfectly moving on to the main event we have the killer gorilla taking on the natural jerry kimnir taking on kyle bohalio odds on this fight are kyle bohalio is a slight to moderate favorite minus 218 minus 200 in some places jerry kimnir can be got between like one my plus 165 and plus 180 i'm looking at a couple different lines there um cool fight uh kind of got made pretty last minute notice which i don't love for either one of these guys like jared kinnanir is coming off of a loss you know back in june where he got knocked out but it was like a pretty bad stoppage like early stoppage and he was looking fine in that fight um kai Ohio, his last time out he took out he took on paul craig that was back in may where he just fucking wasted Paul Craig, which is to be expected. Um, Jared Cannonera, a man that has finishes in three different divisions in the UFC, heavyweight, light heavyweight, and middleweight. It's a shame that he got to MMA so late in his life um, because he's 40 now. Um, and if he was doing like, it just sucks he didn't get to MMA five years earlier. And I wish he was, I wish he learned all the lessons he learned. And he was 35 today, not 40, because I'd have a lot more hope for him, especially like after the Strickland fight, um, where he went tit for tat with Strickland. And he's like the only other person besides Duplessis to be able to do that in middleweight outside of Alex Pajara knocking Strickland the fuck out. Um, yeah. Jared Cannonier, good leg kicks. Pretty tight boxing, really, really violent ground and pound. He, he's he got that same, like, Drikus Duplessis ground and pound, Derek Lewis ground and pound. We're like, Jerry Cannonier is not a grappler, doesn't have good grappling, but you just don't want a guy like that powerful and willingly violent on top of you, his elbows and his punches on top, like the way he finished Derek Brunson. I mean, anybody would die. Any, any middleweight in the division – under Jared Cannonier getting hit like that gets fucking finished. The dude crump like, crushes people on the ground. His elbows extremely violent. Um, he's always been a little chinny, and I think that's my biggest concern for him. Um, and his wrestling defense is not always stuck up. Um, and I, Kai Ohio, he is a guy that is a uh, good grappler. Not a good wrestler, but a good willing grappler. Really good submissions. Pretty good striker. Um, Lyoto Machida kind of karate style. He keeps his head straight up and down. Good step in elbows. He's really good at that. Throws a lot of jump knees. Um, is not scared to just crush the distance from in punching range into elbows or into the clinch. It's really cool. Um, but he's also like the head captain of fighting nerds and like is kind of one of the better coach fighters on the roster secretly and quietly. Like he's fucking good and he's a good fucking coach. Um, one thing I'm learning about Kaya Bahayo is, and all of the fighting nerds is they're clearly incredible game planners and they're 
studious when it comes to tape study. Um, I didn't get talk about Carlos Pratas, but like look at Carlos Pratas, look at Gene Silva, look at all of these guys coming out of this camp. I mean, oh my God, what's your name? Um, Bruno Brazil, just crush Molly McCann, fucking fighting nerds. Like all of these fighters, kind of unassuming in a way, are joining this team and fucking kicking ass. Kyle Bohio is a guy that can devise a game plan, stick to his game plan, and that game plan is tiered to each opponent. There are certain dudes like Justin Gaethje, for example, that are going to have the same fight with everybody. Kyle Bohio is not that dude. Against Paul Craig, he's going to not ra- not grapple and strike. Uh, against other opponents, he is going to not strike and grapple. Um, and he can kind of, you know, he can do it all. Like the way he he... You know, the way he finished Michelle Olajacek, like a pretty dangerous puncher. The dude got into the UFC and had to fight Gadzi Omar Gadziev, who's a not a bad opponent, and Armin Petrosian back-to-back, and then Mokhmed Muradov. This is a big step up for him. Jared Cannonier has fought the who's who over multiple, you know, multiple weight divisions. Like, he's fought freaking Jan Blahovich, Glover Teixeira, like, Dominic Reyes. Anderson Silva, Robert Whitaker, Kelvin Gastelum, Derek Brunson, Israel Adesanya, Sean Strickland, Marvin Vittori, Nasruddin, blah, 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 blah. Jared Cannonier has faced tenfold. Half of Jared Cannonier's resume in the UFC is better than all of Kalabakai, Ohio's. Just, just his last three fights. Like, in his last three fights, he beat the fucking shit out of Marvin Vittori after almost getting finished won a split decision against Sean Strickland, had a close fight, but and kind of got robbed of a, I don't want to say robbed, but robbed of completing the fight against Nasser Dini Um Yeah, it, I just, again, I wish Jared Cannonier was at the stage of his career where he was 35 years old today and not 40. Um, Kaya Bohayo seems to be too intelligent of a fighter, and it's a good sign when he's willing to come into the UFC. He had to fight twice in the Contender Series because they didn't think he was ready, but he came into the UFC and he's not. Will he? He's, he is not trying to knock your socks off. Will he knock your socks off if it's applicable? Damn right he will. But will he fight a really nip tuck fight and have the proper game plan against you to get a dub? He'll also do that too. Um, that's what I think he'll do here. I don't think he's going to try to go to war. With Jared Cannonier, I don't think it'd be smart if he tried to go to war with Jared Cannonier. I think he'd get clubbed up. Um, Jared Cannonier hits real fucking hard. He's got really good leg kicks. I think we're going to see a lot of grappling out of Kaya Bahayo. Um, He's going to stand outside, bladed stands, kind of leap up and down like he does. Maybe he will throw, jump in and crush an elbow, willing to be into the clinch. Kaya Bahayo is fucking huge. Jared Cannonier is a big dude. He's not very tall, but he's like, Chiseled out of stone. Kaya Bahia is a big middleweight. He doesn't have a big reach. He kind of has that Ian Gary build. Um, he's super athletic, super quick. He's surging. He's not coming off of a knockout loss, even though it was kind of an early stoppage. Derek Cannon, he was 40. He had knee surgery prior to his last fight. He was out a while. He's taking, he was out a while off of a knee surgery at 40 years old. Quick turnaround after getting finished. Um, Guys in this situation also don't typically win the fight. So I'm going to go with Kaya Bahayo. I, I think he is going to use a lot of jump knees, a lot of step in elbows to close the distance, try to make tie-ups with Cannoneer, force him against the cage, um, and just try to get some grappling going. I, I think he can expose Cannoneer there. Um, should be a good fight because I kind of don't feel like I have a great read on it either, because I could totally see Cannoneer catching him with something. Cannoneer has a, an uncanny ability to make himself still dangerous throughout the fight, even if he's down. Look at the Marvin Vittori fight. He almost got knocked the fuck out and then came back and clubbed him. Look at the Robert Whitaker fight. Same thing, almost got finished with a broken arm, nearly in the third round finishes Robert Whitaker. Cannoneer is a powerhouse in the division, but one guy's going up, one guy's going down, and I think they're just meeting you know, at a crossing point their career kaya bohio is my pick not confident decent card thank you guys so much for listening to the show i'm the host evan sure check the kick enjoy the fights